uh, welcome to this uh, session. I'm uh, Dr. Prachi Patil, session coordinator for the session Mycobacteria Rheumatism Interface. Uh, I would like to invite for this session uh, the chairperson. Uh, Dr. Chetna Dharmapalai. So she is a consultant rheumatologist, Esther CMI Hospital, Bangalore. And another chairperson, Dr. Alpana Parmar. She is a consultant rheumatologist and visiting rheumatologist at uh, BAPS Hospital, Surat. I would like to invite the ad our other speakers also, Dr. Surat Arya. He will be talking on the basis of our treating latent TB in the conventional demand treated patients with the inflammatory rheumatic diseases. And our another speaker, Dr. Prashant Agarwal from Ludhiana, he will be talking about the outcome of treating coexisting TB in patients with the rheumatic diseases. After these two say, uh, discussions, it will be followed by the panel discussions on the granulomatosis, rheumatic diseases, and my mycobacteria. And after that, the uh, question, answer, and audience interactions will be there. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I ask uh, Dr. Chetna Ma'am to take it forward. Yeah. Very good morning to all of you. Um, so welcome to this session on uh, interface between rheumatic diseases and uh, granulomatous or mycobacterial diseases. So we have a couple of talks. The first one will be on latent TB screening and treatment in patients with rheumatic diseases who are on conventional synthetic DMARDs. The uh, second topic will be on, uh, along the lines of outcome of uh, treating TB in rheumatic diseases. And we will follow these two by uh, panel discussion. Over to you, Dr. Subhratata. Okay. okay. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Danda sir and Ashish Padika sir, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. So, uh, in this talk, I am going to discuss about basis for treating latent tuberculosis in conventional synthetic DMAR treated inflammatory rheumatic disease patients. And I am not going to touch upon the biologicals or the JAK inhibitors. I will only discuss about the conventional DMARDs. I have no disclosures. So before we begin, let me discuss what is latent tubercular infection. LTBI, which is its abbreviation, is defined by the presence of immunoreactivity to tubercular antigens in the absence of clinical and radiological manifestations of active tubercular disease. So why does it concern us? It concerns us because this can reactivate even after decades of this infection and can cause a transmissible disease. So if we discuss the, the natural history of tubercular infection, you will see that once the exposure happens, around 70% of these remain uninfected and 30% of these will become infected. And out of this 30%, only 5 to 10% will develop a prim primary tuberculosis, whereas 90 to 95% will contain the infection and go into a phase of latency. So out of these, uh, people who have latent tubercular infection, around 5 to 10 percent can reactivate and they do usually in first one or two years of uh, getting the latent TB infection. And out of those who all will get re reactivation, around 10 percent are healthy adults, 20 percent are children less than 5, 40 percent are children less than 2, 30 percent have acquired immunodeficiency like HIV positivity and other high risk clinical setting. So our scenario lies in this group which is other high risk clinical settings which could be a uh, patient getting treated with immunomodulation or immunosuppressants for autoimmune rheumatic diseases. So why do we need to worry? Because the magnitude of problem is huge. So the currently in all of our uh, population around 2 billion individuals are there who are latently infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis and I just as, as I mentioned around 5 to 10 percent can react uh, activate to develop a tubercular disease. So let us discuss this in context of Indian population. So we have a population of around 1.412 billion which is the recent most data of November 2022. If we consider that 2 to 3 percent of this population is autoimmune rheumatic disease 
adding uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, spondyloarthritis, and psoriasis who require disease modifying medications. So this accounts up to 4.23 crores. And 30% is having latent TB. This has been shown in multiple studies, even in data from the rheumatic disease patients. And if we consider 5 to 10 will reactivate, so active tuberculosis magnitude is huge to the tune of 6.35 lakh tubercular cases. So that is why we must be aware of this problem that the magnitude is huge. So now let us directly move on to what do we have about the safety of conventional synthetic DMARDs and tubercular reactivation. So first of all, I will present a recent data which was uh, presented as an abstract in ACR 2022 in which they uh, showed 31 studies which included 8 cohorts, 7 case control, 1 clinical trial and 15 case reports. And they showed that tubercular or methotrexate, tuberculosis with methotrexate was significantly higher seen as compared to tuberculosis without methotrexate when comparing to general population. And they had multiple other uh, data but the data evidence is low because these are usually case reports and cohort studies only. So we should be very careful, especially if the uh, administration of steroids and other immunosuppressants are done along with methotrexate. Let us see what further data we have. So this is another uh, abstract which was presented in European Res Respiratory Society Annual Congress in 2013. They had 44 patients, 93% were females and they were rheumatoid arthritis who were treated with methotrexate 50 mg weekly or methotrexate with corticosteroids and the maximum dose was 10 mg prednisolone equivalent per day. All the subjects were screened for latent tuberculosis with the quantiferon TB gold and they were reassessed after one year for tubercular reactivation. So 11 patients were positive and of these these two patients had pulmonary TB at the beginning itself. On follow-up, one subject who was having quantiferon TB gold at the baseline and normal chest radiography developed TB. So one out of 11 developed TB, that is as high as around 9.09%. So this is a, obviously a low quality evidence, but this shows that methotrexate may be implicated in reactivation of tuberculosis. Now. Uh, Let us move on to what data we have from Canada. It is a cohort of patients with RA from Quebec province and they analyzed these patients from 1992 to 2003 and they showed that out of all the DMARDs which are used for rheumatoid arthritis patients, the maximum risk was associated with leflunamide and methotrexate and cyclosporin were having almost uh, equal risk and the the risk because of steroid was much lower than methotrexate and cyclosporin, probably because most rheumatoids require low dose corticosteroids only, uh, not high dose like uh, required in lupus nephritis or myositis. So methotrexate and cyclosporin were uh, increased risk of tuberculosis, but highest risk was associated with leflunamide. Another data from Sweden in which they have studied the uh, tuberculosis in biological naive versus biological exposed patients over the time period of 2002 to 2006 and 2007 to 2011. So you can clearly see as compared to general population, the biological naive group who were treated with DMARDs had higher uh, incidence of tuberculosis, but this was definitely much lower than the patients who were treated with biologicals, mainly TNF-alpha blockers. So if we uh, go into detail of what DMARDs these patients were on. So in this uh, analysis, they found that azathioprine use in one year before the onset of TB was maximally associated with the risk of tuberculosis followed by leflunamide and methotrexate in their study was not associated with reactivation of tuberculosis. So most of our rheumatological guidelines do not uh, recommend to screen for latent TB before we start methotrexate, but there are few societies which consider methotrexate as an important risk factor for reactivation of TB. So this National Psoriasis Foundation consensus statement which came in, which was there in 2008, they clearly mentioned that methotrexate is associated with reactivation of TB and screening for latent TB is recommended before starting this treatment for psoriasis patients. Now we know that 
The diagnosis of latent tubercular infection is mainly done by a tubercular skin test or interferon gamma release assay. But these tests have their own flaws because they are neither 100% specific nor sensitive. And a positive IGRA or TST cannot distinguish between the present infection from the present disease, nor can it distinguish between present from past infection. So there are significant limitations. There is a good amount of evidence which says that the majority of individuals in whom we are suspecting LTPI, they may have actually cleared the infection and the immunoreactivity just persists. So we may not uh, worry too much that these patients will develop tuberculosis later on. However, on the other hand, you have a group of patients who will have negative TST like patients who are immunocompromised with acquired immunodeficiency uh, with HIV. Also, 10 to 40 percent of HIV negative individuals who are culture confirmed and have Miller TB because Miller TB itself can become an immunocompromising condition. In those patients, you can have a negative TST despite they have been having an active tuberculosis at that point of time. So, we have very uh, uh, significant data from Northern India in which this study was published from Ames, New Delhi, in which they had 1,511 household contacts of pulmonary TB patients and they analyzed all these patients with TST nigra and neither TST nor IGRA predicted subsequent development of active TB among the household contacts of pulmonary TB patients, just clearly uh, highlighting that the limitation of these tests is there. If we talk about the autoimmune rheumatic diseases patients who are treated with biological, so this is the data from uh, Karnataka, in which they had 195 patients who were initiated on biological therapy. 21 patients came positive for latent TB and were given prophylaxis and you will not be surprised that the, all the patients who developed tuberculosis later on were from the group which were negative for latent TB screening before. So probably we could not pick these patients before starting the immuno, uh, before starting the biologic, biological therapy. So what is the drawback of uh, uh, this uh, strategy. We are unnecessarily screening and leading to exposure of patients to needless hazard and increased cost to healthcare system. So suppose we get a false positive test which can be seen in BCG uh, vaccinated patients. So these patients may come positive in form of Montu reactivity and we expose them to these kind of medications when actually they may not require them. So this fellow, this a strategy definitely has a fallacy. So now moving on to and sharing some of our research work which I did as a uh, DM resident in SGPJ, we tried to find out a better way to diagnose latent tuberculosis and also to find a way if we can predict development of active tuberculosis from latent TB. So for this we uh, used another novel protein present in the mycobacterium wall which is the alpha crystalline protein and we checked this immune response to this protein in a patient latently inf uh, infected with tuberculosis. So this protein is unique and different from other mycobacterial uh, wall proteins. So this membrane protein is a heat shock protein and it is believed to sustain the bacilli during the latent or the dormant phase of infection. So this protein is abundantly produced in dormant bacilli and is a strong inducer of both T and B cell response and this returns to normal level during rapid multiplication. So this is a unique protein which is expressed in the bacteria in the dormancy and the expression of this protein decreases once the bacteria starts to multiply. So this is a potential biomarker for LTBI because this is, we can consider that this protein is more present in the latent phase than in the active phase. And it is a dynamic marker because the change in expression is also reflected in the change in the immune response. So suppose if a patient has uh, been tested today, so we can check the antibody response against this uh, protein and if it is high probably the bacteria are in the latent phase and once the response to this protein goes down probably the latent phase from is shifting to the active phase. So this is the data to support that. So this is the first column here is the medium. This is basically a diagram to show a proliferative T cell response of 
हेल्थ केयर वर्कर्स एंड ट्यूबरकुलर पेशेंट्स टू दी अल्फा क्रिस्टलाइन प्रोटीन सो वट वी डिड इज वी टुक द ब्लड सैंपल ऑफ दीज पेशेंट्स पुट द टी सेल्स इन दी ब्लड कल्चर एंड सॉ द रिस्पॉन्स ऑफ द टी सेल प्रोलिफ्रेशन ऑन एक्सपोजर टू दिस वेरियस स्टिमुलस सो फर्स्ट इज द मीडियम द सेकेंड इज द ऑक्यूपेशनल कॉन्टैक्ट्स थर्ड इज द हेल्दी कॉन्टैक्ट्स fourth is the completed tubercular treatment and the last one is the active tb so you can clearly see those patients who had active tuberculosis had a much lower response to uh, this alpha crystalline uh, protein as a t cell response you can see and all other groups which probably were latently infected with tb had a high t cell response to this alpha crystalline protein we also analyzed the patterns of T cell and B cell response to mycobacterium tubercular uh, membrane associated antigen and its relationship with disease activity and rheumatoid arthritis in patients with latent tubercular infection so it has been speculated that latent tb or prior exposure to tuberculosis can be associated in the pathogenesis of various autoimmune rheumatic diseases so in this study we could show that patients who had higher response to the mycobacterial wall antigens had higher disease activity and this pattern could also be seen in the follow up as the disease activity reduced the the t cell response to this mycobacterial wall antigen also decreased so this is a good correlation there uh, we cannot end our talk without discussing about the latest 2022 ular recommendation for screening and prophylaxis of chronic opportunistic infections these uh, guidelines were published around 3 weeks back and the the gist of this guidelines in relation to latent, latent tuberculosis is that screening for latent tb is recommended in patients prior to starting biological demand or targeted synthetic demand this we are all are aware they have also mentioned that screening should be considered in patients with increased risk of latent tb prior to starting conventional synthetic demand immunosuppressants and or glucocorticoids just one more slide they have also mentioned this data is also the, was there previously that screening should be considered particularly in those patients who are likely to receive more than 15 mg of prednisolone <coughs> or equivalent for a longer period of more than 4 weeks and tubercular risk factors they have described as alcohol abuse smoking people living uh, with people who have tb infection and people living in endemic countries and they have also given a statement that interferon gamma release assay they can perform better than tst in the diagnosis of latent tb but we can consider performing both the test if the suspicion for latent tb is high or in endemic countries so with this i complete and conclude my session and i request dr chetna ma'am to come on the stage so uh, just to um, summarize whatever dr suvrit arya has uh, spoken about um, so we are not going to screen everybody every rheumatic disease patient that is treated with conventional synthetic demards for latent tb so patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases particularly rheumatoid arthritis are at a higher risk of developing tuberculosis due to a combination of anti rheumatic drugs and their immune dysregulation which is intrinsic to the disease Uh, some of the risk factors uh, you should consider screening patients for latent tb would be somebody who who is of elderly age who have comorbidities like diabetes hypertension cardiovascular disease copd interstitial lung disease ckd um these are the patients that are may, that may be at a risk of tb reactivation especially if they're on steroids the dose as mentioned by dr suvrit more than 15 mg for a period more than 4 weeks as well as immunosuppressant drugs screening for latent tb in patients before starting csd marts is not routinely practiced worldwide 
risk with methotrexate when you combine the evidence that is present when you consider the sort of the uh, overall uh, data that we have methotrexate is not found to be elevated uh, uh, to have an elevated risk for uh, um, latent tb reactivation unless the patient is on um, a co-prescription with high doses of steroids or other immunosuppressant medications some studies as we just saw have shown increased risk with leflunomide and azathioprine so something we should be aware of and uh, to uh, um, uh, f the final slide really to um, uh, summarize the eula guidelines yes we do screen patients before giving them biologic drugs and transitional synthetic dmards for latent tb but also do consider screening for latent tb in high risk patients prior to starting immunosuppressants that is cyclophosphamide mycophenolate mofetil azathioprine and the cnis and high doses of steroids screening should be along with a combination of chest x-ray igra as well as montu considering the falsies um, associated with individual testing the choice and duration of latent tb therapy should be guided by national and or international guidelines thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Subhra Tharia and Dr. Chetna Dharmapala, ma'am, for this wonderful session. Now we will move to the next uh, our talk. Uh, talk will be given by the Dr. Prashant Agarwal uh, on outcome of treating coexisting TB in patients with the rheumatic diseases. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chairpersons. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I shall be talking about my experience. I shall be talking about my experience of treating the coexisting tuberculosis in patients with rheumatic disorders and what was their outcome. I don't have any conflict of interest to declare for, uh, pertinent to this talk, but yes, another disclaimer: my talk might leave you with more questions than answers. So to begin with, first of all, the Newton's third law, which all of us have studied. Every action has got an equal and opposite reaction. We all know immune-mediated inflammatory diseases can impact tuberculosis. Patients of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases are more prone to developing tuberculosis. Also, some of our treatments, especially the biologicals and targeted small molecules, they are associated with increased risk of developing tuberculosis. So if our immune-mediated diseases have an impact on tuberculosis? Can tuberculosis also impact our immune-mediated inflammatory diseases? Does tuberculosis make our tuberculosis patients more prone to developing autoimmune disorders? And does it have any impact on the severity and the outcome of an immune-mediated inflammatory disease? So that is what something that I'm going to discuss about. First of all, to begin with, what were my initial thoughts about tuberculosis when I started my rheumatology practice? It was largely based on skepticism. And I used to feel that it is often overdiagnosed by primary care physicians, which at times even now takes place. And immune-mediated disorders are often misdiagnosed as tuberculosis. And when the patient comes to us, we find out that it was not actually tuberculosis, but was a case of vasculitis or something else. But yes, tuberculosis reactivation always has been a cause of concern, especially since the advent of anti-TNF therapy. And later tuberculosis, again, has been a cause of concern and sometimes a cause of irritation as well. Latent tuberculosis has been described by Sugrat in his previous slides. So to start with my clinical experience, first of all, I'd like to present a case of 28 years old lady who had been a diagnosed case of ankylosing spondylitis for eight years duration. It was predominantly an axial disease. She had been tried on conventional disease modifying drugs, was on combination of sulfasalazine and methotrexate, and had received multiple NSAIDs in the past. But she had not responded to that and her back pain had worsened steadily over the past nine months. The disease was never in remission, never under control, always there was a high disease activity, but the intensity of pain had worsened steadily over the past nine months, and she was having an incapacitating back pain for the past two months. That was the time when she consulted me. I can still remember this patient came to my clinic on a wheelchair. So bad was the back pain that she was not able to stand up properly. Her s dash was 4.8, indicating a high disease activity, and CRP was 18, again quite elevated. 
Looking at her back pain, I thought that there might be some local cause for her back pain. We got her x-rays done. X-rays were consistent with ankylosing spondylitis. There was scaring of vertebrae, syndesmophytes. There were no fractures or anything else to indicate any other pathology. There was also present bilateral sacroiliitis. So inadequate response to previous therapies, high disease activity made her a candidate for infliximab. So as is required, we did a Montus test on her and it came out to be strongly positive. As you can see on this picture, As you can see on this picture, it was quite strongly positive. The intensity of Montus positive of this patient was 28 millimeters. So looking at such a florid Montus test, CT chest was normal and there was no evidence of active tuberculosis on clinical evaluation. But still looking at this Montus test being strongly positive of 28 millimeters, it was decided that instead of giving just a prophylaxis, this patient should be treated with full course of ATT. So the patient was started on four drugs, ATT. Indomethacin was continued. And after one month, patient noticed 50% improvement in her back pain. CRP declined from 18 to 12. After six months of ATT, she had 90% improvement in her symptoms. And as per SDS, she had an active disease. It had come down to 1.3. Now the patient has been on follow for past four years and is doing well on sulfasal as in one gram and on demand indomethacin. The question of requirement of biologicals did not rise. So was latent tuberculosis driving the inflammation in this patient was the question. The caveat is that the imaging of spine was not done in this patient. So it is possible that this patient could have been having tuberculosis spondylodiscitis which was not picked up on x-ray. Why is this important is because there is another patient I would like to bring about a 29 years male, chronic low back pain and HLA B27 positive. When we went and did a MRI on this patient what we found was these large abscesses along his spine. And there was also an abscess in the vertebral body. And you can see some pus tracking down the spinal canal also. And there was no sacroiliitis in this patient. This patient was actually B27 positive, chronic low back pain. But there was no sacroiliitis. And all the symptoms could be attributed to tuberculosis involvement of the spine. And after three months of ATT, you can see there is significant resolution that has taken place. So in the first patient, it might have been that there could have been some active tuberculosis that was affecting the spine or it could be the latent tuberculosis also that could have been driving the process but we do not have the imaging study on that patient. There was another 23 years old male who had clear cut enclosing spondylitis, presence of sacroiliitis but what we find is these abscesses can be seen on the back just on clinical evaluation. The pus was aspirated and that also turned out to be positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. This patient was started on ATT and following ATT Improvement took place in back pain, but that could have been because of the improvement of tubercular involvement of the spine. So for the first patient, we did not, we are not very sure whether it was actually latent tuberculosis or not, but we did not have any clear-cut evidence of tubercular involvement in this patient. Post that, I came across another patient. This was a 58 years old male. He had 10 years history of enclosing spondylitis, again axial disease, high disease activity. Again, inadequate response to sulfasalazine and NSH planned for infliximab. In this case, Montus test was positive 40 millimeters at day three. In this case, we did go ahead and do a MRI of the spine with sacroiliac joints and we did not find any evidence of tuberculosis. CT of the chest was also normal. He was treated with ATT, which led on to partial recovery. Three years follow-up, he is better on sulfasalazine on demand naproxen. His SDS has come down significantly, so he has had a positive response. So possibly in this case, it was the latent tuberculosis which was driving the inflammatory response in this patient. Another case, 35 years old male, a known case of psoriatic arthritis, both peripheral and axial involvement was present in this case. He developed anterior uveitis. Corticosteroids were started by the ophthalmologist, did not have a response to that, failed on methotrexate. There was no evidence of active or latent tuberculosis in this patient. Montus quantifront TB gold test were negative, as was well the CT test was absolutely normal. This patient was given biosimilar infliximab infusion, 3 mg per kg, at weeks 0, 2, and 6. This led on to rapid resolution of uveitis. However, two weeks after the third infusion of infliximab, he came with fever and profuse sweating. CT test was done, which was showing mildred tuberculosis, which was consistent with mildred tuberculosis. Was started on ATT. He had an inadequate response to the ATT after two months. Patient was referred to the pulmonologist. He modified his ATT to which he responded. 
After the completion of tubercular therapy, he had a recurrence of cervical lymphadenopathy after eight months of completing the tubercular Again, he had to be started on entry by the pulmonologist. But the point in this case is that the uveitis and arthritis, they still continue to be in remission. Skin continues to be active, but uveitis and arthritis, they have not come back. And this patient is not on any disease-modifying therapy as of now. So could tuberculosis, latent tuberculosis or active tuberculosis being a driving factor behind the inflammation that we encounter in these patients? That is the question that I would like to address. We have had four cases of latent tuberculosis who have been treated with full course of ATT. The basis of choosing full course of ATT was largely empirical based on the intensity of positivity of Montreux test. Two patients achieved inactive disease or low disease activity following ATT. One patient had improvement, one, one patient did require biological therapy. Two patients developed tuberculosis on anti-TNF therapy. One of the patients I have discussed. The other case was on biosimilar etanercept, developed tuberculosis after three years of biosimilar etanercept. This is a patient of enclosing spondylitis. In this patient, we did not notice any significant improvement attributable to the response to any significant improvement in the enclosing spondylitis activity. Four patients had overt tuberculosis at the presentation. Two patients had paraspinal abscesses. One patient had pulmonary infiltrates and one patient had granulomatous lymphadenitis. In these patients also, we noticed that two patients had improvement in their spondyloarthropathy disease activity following the completion of course of antitubercular therapy. Thereby, in certain cases, it is a possibility that latent tuberculosis or active tuberculosis could be driving the inflammatory process and in case we are able to control that adequately, that can in turn lead on to some improvement in their inflammatory disease. Coming on to rheumatoid arthritis, a 45 years old lady, 10 years history of rheumatoid factor and anti-CCB positive rheumatoid arthritis, had an erosive disease, was on treatment with combination of methotrexate, leflunomide, hydroxychloroquine and prednisolone. Disease still continued to be active with a DAS28 of 4.6. This patient also had ankle synovitis, which, the joint, which is not counted in the DAS28 score. Developed severe headache, vomiting and fever was diagnosed by the neurologist as tubercular meningitis on the basis of CSF anal analysis. Microbiology was negative in this patient. PCR analysis was not done. But he stopped methotrexate and leflunomide, gave a short course of dexamethasone, and one year of ATT was given. Meningitis of this patient recovered. Arthritis activity also improved while the patient was on ATT. Whether it was because of ATT or dexamethasone, that is a debatable point. But approximately eight years after dexamethasone and seven years post ATT, patient is on methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine on demand naproxen. We have been able to stop the leflunomide. We have been able to stop the prednisolone. Patient is not in remission, but has got a low disease activity state. Again, indicating that there is a possibility that tuberculosis process was somewhere driving the process. This patient had not been screened for latent tuberculosis. It was not actually required in this case. But it is possible that some degree of tubercular activity could have been driving the inflammatory response. Patient developed meningitis, was treated for that, and post that, the disease activity has come down to a certain extent. Rheumatoid arthritis and tuberculosis, we have had six patients. Four patients developed tuberculosis while on follow-up. None of these patients are on biologicals. One of these patients had severe, one of the patients had tubercular lymphadenitis, had severe reaction to ATT once the ATT was started and subsequently the patient was lost to follow-up. Two patients had better control of disease activity post ATT. One patient was being considered for tofacitinib, so the screening for latent tuberculosis was done. Montuk's test turned out to be positive. A CT test was done. There was a very small pulmonary nodule on CT chest, which the pulmonologist did not feel was relevant, but still he went ahead gave four drug ATT and did not notice any change in the disease activity per se in this patient. Two patients had active tuberculosis at presentation. Both the patients improved with ATT, but the caveat is that the baseline disease activity pre-tuberculosis is not available in these patients. So whether the improvement, the patient reported improvement that took place was because of the response to tuberculosis or whether it was an actual response in the inflammatory disease cannot be said. We also have one patient of leprosy with rheumatoid arthritis who required lesser dose of disease-modifying drugs post-leprosy treatment. This slide Suvrat has already shown to you. In this slide, they studied the relation of T and B cell response to mycobacterium tuberculosis and disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis. They found that the <coughs> patients who had latent tuberculosis had heightened T cell responses, and, and the patients who had got a heightened T cell response 
had an increased disease activity. They did not find any correlation between the B cell responses and the disease activity in this study. There was another study that came from Taiwan. It was a population-based retrospective analysis in then which they tried to look at does previous history of tuberculosis have any bearing of subsequent development of rheumatoid arthritis? And what they found is that the base, amongst the baseline comorbidities, the highest risk ratio was for tuberculosis for the development of rheumatoid arthritis subsequently. This was quite a big study. And they also analyzed the risk of development of mm, <coughs> tuberculosis in those patients who went on to develop rheumatoid arthritis or not. They included 26,000 patients of rheumatoid arthritis in their study. And what they found was that the odds ratio was significantly higher of, of tuberculosis in patients who had subsequently went on to develop rheumatoid arthritis, meaning thereby that a preceding history of having tuberculosis could be a driving factor for developing rheumatoid arthritis later on in their life. What could be the mechanism of tuberculosis aggravating the immune-mediated immune inflammatory diseases? It could be cytokine production. TNF is a natural candidate that we can consider. It could be bystander activation of autoreactive T cells and it could be molecular mimicry as well. The heat shock protein, protein of mycobacterium closely remembers, uh, resembles the uh, antigen that is expressed on the cartilage. Coming on to SLE, we had four patients who developed tuberculosis on follow-up. One had tuberculosis tenosynovitis, two pulmonary tuberculosis, and one patient had abscess in the scapular area. All felt better post-ATT, but we felt that the responsiveness was largely due to recovery of tuberculosis and not because of the recovery of SLE per se. In two patients of scleroderma who recovered falling ATT, but there was no response to scleroderma in these patients. Few other observations that I would like to make. Montux test, it is recommended that it could be read at 48 hours or 72 hours. In my experience, it is better read at 72 hours instead of 48 hours. That increases the sensitivity of the test. Some patients can have even a delayed response beyond 72 hours. I will just take two minutes more to end my talk. So it is always better to examine the Montux test site in all patients, whatever time frame they come to you, and instruct the patients even after 72 hours to report in case they notice any reaction coming up at that site, and prefer doing Montux test in-house. That gives you a better control over the methodology of this test. This is the delayed response to Montux test. This patient was negative at 72 hours, was put on treatment, and when he came back after two weeks, this was the reaction that was noticed in Montux. This patient was totally negative for his Montux at day three. Again, this patient was negative at day three. No, this patient was negative at day two. This was a case of panuveitis, and day six, you can notice the reaction that has come up. This is a case of enclosing spondylitis with uveitis and a rash on the nose. This is a peplonecrotic kind of a rash. After seven days of ATT, the size of the lesion is the same, but you can see the lesion has started healing. So to conclude, I feel impact of tuberculosis is more pervasive than we suspect. It can have varied presentation. In addition to the direct tissue invasion, it can cause aggravation of the underlying disease process. We do need better diagnostic tools, and maybe we need to revisit the existing ones. Regress data collection is required. I would like to th thank Dr. Debashi Thanda. This is a picture taken recently when he visited my center. And <clears throat> he was the one who motivated me to present this talk. Revisiting the Newton's third law post-marriage, I would not say that I've become wiser, but yes, I have got some more experience over years. Post-marriage, you can say for every action, there is an opposite reaction, but it is not necessarily equal. It can be exponential and it can often be bewildering. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Uh, one, can I ask one question, Dr. Agarwal? How did you prove tuberculosis in your UVITs patient? Ma'am, we did not prove. It was purely empirical basis of treatment. As I said, the patients had latent tuberculosis. The decision of giving ATT was largely empirical based on the intensity of Montus positive. The last what patient that- What is the incidence of latent tuberculosis in general population in, in India? Up to 30% of patients can be positive for Montux test positivity. In these cases, we did not treat all the patients of latent tuberculosis with full course of ATT. Again, an empirical decision was taken that patients who had a strong positive Montux, which was empirically chosen at a level more than 20 millimeters, those were the patients who were given ATT. And data only for those patients has been presented. So your UVITs patient had 6 mm Montux? Did not have 6 mm Montux, ma'am. 
that was the day six montus that was shown the picture. Day six montu. Yeah, patient had negative montus on day two, but on day six we saw this reaction. We have the chair's permission to ask a question. Yes, sir, please. Rohini Handa, New Delhi. Uh, Prashant, enjoyed your talk, and as you rightly said, in fact, they say latent tuberculosis in India is 40 percent, and you showed Professor Sharma's publication. Now, with a country with 40 percent latent tuberculosis, the question is when we screen them for biologicals, or for that matter, jack inhibitors, a large proportion of people will turn out to have latent tuberculosis. Then to compound matters, some of them have been on jack inhibitors instituted by an orthopedic surgeon two months ago, three months ago. Where does that leave us? Should we, I, I mean, it's a question to the house, to you, to everyone. Should we then ask them to stop the jack inhibitor? then get the uh, latent tuberculosis testing again because the vast majority of jack inhibitor prescriptions in our country are emanating from orthopedic surgeons. And then if you have listened to the patient's travails, he goes to a pulmonologist who tells him forget this uh, latent TB test. And he comes back and says, Daksab, you told me to take tuberculosis treatment. My pulmonologist said forget it. Everybody in India is positive. I think as a body, maybe we need to have some clear guidelines, both from a medical legal aspect. I'm not very sure whether this latent tuberculosis screening for all people on jack inhibitors, and if I can stretch up my point further, if methotrexate were to be introduced today, they would recommend screening even for methotrexate. That's the way medicine is practiced now, and I'm not too sure. I seek the wisdom of others in the house. I totally agree to a lot of the points that you made, sir. As I said before my talk, that it might leave more questions than answers. I was just sharing my experience that this is what I have observed, and possibly these observations do raise certain questions that we need to take up. But yes, I totally agree to a lot of points that you have made. Uh, very good talk, sir. And I must thank Danda sir for giving this topic, uh, uh, raising this topic, this issue. Every year I see five, six patients uh, of having this tuberculosis uh, issue. And uh, I made a protocol. In my patients, if patient is not responding to primary treatment, full dose, full support, I do screen for underlying infections. And uh, once, maybe uh, screening for latent TB is negative. I, I have given ATT profile axis and many patients responded. One case, just I want to highlight, Patient of lupus uh, having uh, uncontrolled his activity with full dose of treatment, uh, standard treatment, uh, all uh, screening test negative. I did PET scan. And in PET scan, in fallopian tube, there was fluid. I started ATD, patient improved. So we have, if primary disease is not improving, we have to, we should caution ourselves. Yes, absolutely. So that was the whole point we of this time. presentation that, okay. Uh, Honda sir's question is very pertinent, and I think there are no easy answers. Professor Malavia has some data on that, but I think uh, the, the two things were, one was regarding exacerbation of uh, uh, disease uh, by the tubercular antigen or tuberculosis. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, is, you know, ankylosing is a TH17 predominant, and, and if you look at uh, the motto is an uh, delayed hypersensitivity, so interferon gamma more. I don't know conceptually how that would lead to increase in, uh, in uh, spondyloarthritis. I'm sure there must be those cytokines also in tuberculosis, but that may be worth looking at what kind of cytokines are involved when you have tuberculosis. And having said that, I have at least uh, two cases of Takayasu with active tuberculosis. And the tuberculosis came first, and soon after the Takayasu came. She did not have the Takayasu before. And also two GPAs, which were, to me, they look like having been flared by um, tuberculosis, uh, you know, active tuberculosis first and then soon getting GPA. So I think we, what you say is right, and erythema nodosum, one very severe case, paniculitis, for two, three years, giving immunosuppression, finally giving ATT because the monto turned out to be strongly positive, as you said, and then she never had, he never had uh, paniculitis. So what you are saying does make sense. I think we need to collate data and 
come out with some. Yes, that is the most important thing that we need to collate data and we need to drop a bit of our skepticism regarding tuberculosis and be more open to it. Regarding the question regarding the interferon signature, we did not do any analysis of that. It was largely a clinical observation. But one thing, especially I was actually reading the current edition of Harrison also, we actually tried to label our patients into boxed categories. That this is a patient who has got a latent tuberculosis, this is a patient who has got active tuberculosis, and this is a patient who has got a treated tuberculosis. We should actually stop seeing tuberculosis in that pattern, but rather trying to see this as a continuum. Latent tuberculosis and active tuberculosis is actually a complex interplay between the host factors and the bacterium. Once the host factors, they tend to go down, it tends to become activated, which is the point when it becomes activated. And once it becomes active tuberculosis, do we actually have the test to actually indicate that this is the point it has become active? That is a question that we need to consider. Uh, um, my question is more, I'm Veer Chaturvedi from Delhi. Uh, my question is more basic, basically because I got involved in a roughly a legal battle. Uh, 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 the BCG is a universal phenomenon in this country. Uh, uh, this question is for the previous, uh, the, the one who spoke before you. Uh, how does the BCG affect the uh, Mantuk's test and the Quantiferon gold? Simple question. Since if all of us in this hall had got BCG, how it affects? Then I'll tell you how the legal case involved and I had to spend a lot of money in that. So, Brat, I think you spoke about the... Hello? This has to be found out because in this country it is universal. It is not in US. The BCG is not... Uh, this is in this country. Not in Europe, I think. If I re remember correctly, BCG is in this, every child born is given BCG. So I just wanted to know that. So sir, false. I, I wish Dr. Malviya was here. He, 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 he keeps talking about on this issue. But probably I missed it. Dr. Ashok or Dr. Handa, if any, anybody can throw this. I think, may I, the mantle positivity yeah. can be there in the patients who've had BCG and even in NTMs also. But IGRAs are positive only when with, with uh, MTB. So the, between the two, MAN2 would be positive in TB infection, latent TB infection, NTMs and BCG. Whereas IGRA is, is supposed to be positive only with the, with the MTB infection. So you feel IGRA is not positive with the man test? With the BCG? With the BCG, yeah. with the BC, sorry. With BCG, with yes. the BC, so if BCG is given, so since all are given BCG, so, so only, both tests are only, required. Only yes. problem arises if you have MAN2 negative and Quantifron okay. uh, positive, which also is... Uh, a more is a bigger dilemma actually. We have to answer uh, this question. Yeah, please take care. She's been waiting. Sorry. Your mic. Tuberculosis. I'm sure we all do come across from time to time patients who have received rituximab uh, develop uh, active uh, tuberculosis. I'm recently treating a patient with uh, Wegener's granulomatosis who has had the disease for about four to five years now and has been in complete remission on uh, um, yearly maintenance of 500 mg of rituximab. And he had missed two doses during COVID uh, period as he was worried about uh, taking rituximab uh, um, during the COVID. And uh, just when he was been planning, <coughs> planning to repeat the rituximab, he uh, presented with lung symptoms which uh, seemed very much like a flare-up of uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, but um, he had a cavitatory lesion and uh, high fevers with significant weight loss over a period of three to four weeks. And uh, when he had a bronchoscopy, and uh, AFP was positive and gene expert was positive. So uh, he, he, he's being treated with uh, uh, ATT along with, uh, uh, I mean, after about four months of receiving ATT, I have had to repeat rituximab because his Wegener's granulomatosis started flaring up. So I'm sure we all uh, come across patients time to time on uh, rituximab developing TB. For rituximab, we are not usually doing latent TB screening routinely, but for TNF-alpha and jacinibs only, we are doing routinely. 
I just had a comment. My name is Dr. Anand Rao from Bangalore. To what Dr. Vaid Chaturvedi was asking, a small comment, that when you give BCG, because we deal this with this as uh, pediatricians and pediatric rheumatologists, the reaction to MAN2 tends to be less than 10 millimeters. Anything more than 10 millimeters is considered positive. Less than 10 millimeters can be as a reaction of the body, immune system to your BCG. And uh, regarding IGRA, the antigens which are used in the IGRA tests don't overlap with MTB antigens. So if IGRA is positive, then it means an infection and not BCG reaction. Thank you. Just to, just to add on to that, as per the current Harrison's textbook of medicine, in case BCG vaccination has been done 10 years ago, it doesn't have any impact on Montux testing. Do we have time for one more comment? Amit Sharma from Chandigarh. Uh, coming to rituximab and TB um, conundrum, if you, we were a part of the image trial which led on to the uh, rituximab uh, approval in rheumatoid arthritis and there were four centers from India and there were other centers from the developing countries also. Uh, in none of that, it's, it was a large trial and in none of those patients, uh, TB was reported and it was a kind of a long follow-up study. With the, it was kind of a, from 2006 till 2011. So f with that and uh, with our own experience, it, it seems that the TB risk is relatively lesser but having said that, as Dr. Chetana has said, once in a while since we are living in an endemic country, uh, we, we have to keep our antennas, uh, you know, this index of suspicion high. In our experience also, we've had at least four patients, I think a couple of them ha having had rituximab, which developed to a TB. But risk seems to be lower as compared to, say, anti-TNS, but it's not that uh, it's zero. We can conclude this session now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, organizers.